Right, um, so day seven, day seven. Uh, we didn't bring the sternus yesterday, but don't forget that's available. You need to see the six digit code. Um, and then I will give you details how to send me that code. There's been so far that I know, don't tell everybody you've seen it, but I know definitely two people have seen it. Just pause it there, do I'm um, going to try and give you a little bit more than we did yesterday. Um, right, so basically, I'm putting a window in this wall. The window is 1200 by 1000, so it is 1200 wide and it's 1000 high. Now, what we want is a little bit of wiggle room so that we can get it in nice. And I know the customer wants it in this location, off that stud there, which will go to there. So we will need to take that one out, that one out, that one out. Putting the timber across there to support the window and we're going to put in a double one above the window as well. Um, the reason why we didn't do it at the time is because I, the customer didn't know where he wanted it at the time. Until it's built, they often want to come in and then say, right, I'm going to have a desk there, I'll have my window here, or vice versa. So that's what we're going to do. Right, so I know my window, we're coming off this leg here, yeah? So I know my window is f a thousand high. Yep. I also want 38 and 38, which is 76, yeah? 76 mil which will give me top timber bottom timber and I also want 10 mil gap so that there is this is the bottom line that I'm going to cut out that's where I want to be basically so I'm going to level that in a minute but first what I'm going to do before I do that is get a new bit in here um but we haven't got one what bit are you uh, uh talk bit there right so what I'm going to do first is get a timber across this bottom just to support these other timbers when I knock them out. It doesn't have to be a particular level, I'm not overly fussed about that. Just gonna hold that there like that. And this will put a bit of rigidity into the wall. Stop it. Because I'm gonna spray these timbers out, so I'll need some like that to keep them nice and steady. Brandon, will you cut me um, that, that four by two there? I'll give you a line for it. I'm fine with the you now. Right. Um, I want, I'm going to put a timber shirt across the bottom there, so I want it 15, 58 please Brandon. Right, so that's my mark, I know that's where I want to cut it out, yeah? So what I'm going to do now is get my level, and I'll put my glasses on. And I'll level that line across, you can see there, there look, got it level, yeah. So I'll take that one out, that one out. And that one out. Yeah, that's what I'm taking out. Get my square and square them lines around. Barely see that one, do you? So what what I probably shouldn't have done is get them to um slate button the outside yesterday which I did do um, but we'll talk about slate buttons as well Brandon do you want to cut the metal for the back wall you know the uh, resilient bars yes. get them to length but don't fix them yeah well. all right all right carry on then sorry I thought you finished yeah. right so all of they want to come out now the uh, method of choice would be for circular saw really get as far in as I can um, and it'll give me a square cut then as well It's not perfect. Right, tell you what I've done there now. I've chopped that one out. So what we'll do, we'll come off that one and move window that way. Okay, what I've done, cut through that one in my haste and shouldn't have done, but what I'm gonna do now is put another timber there. So we'll go sideways onto that one. <laughs> Right, 
Brandon's just No, it's full, room. mate. Right, hammer. Where's my hammer? I can't use that stainless camera. We've got one out. Right, so I've cut through them now. I need to take them out now. So this is retrofitting it. Um, there is no other option but to bray them out. Right, so, you see the window open, it's starting to come to light now. Um, what I'm going to do now is get a Langle grinder out. Um, so what I'm going to do now, we're just going to trim off the nails that are in the way. Obviously, they're going to impede me. Um, like we talked about tools before, all my stuff is Makita. John's predominantly Milwaukee. Um, we'll talk about pack outs later today as well. So my pack out has died. So what I want to do now is cut the nails out of here, get rid of them. Right, that should now give me enough room there. Right, so what I did, I didn't cut that one out, I stupidly cut that one, but the customer did actually want it further to that side. So I'm doubting this timber's going to fit. It's shy. Right, Brandon, we're getting them all 4 b 2 it don't always go to plan. Um, what, I'd intentionally, what I intentionally meant to do was to take that one out, but obviously I've not done that. Right, so because of what I've done there, like I said, it doesn't always go to plan. Brandon, you cut that one, mate. I'll just double check that measurement, Brandon. 1567. So it's slightly out. Um, so what he's going to do, he's going to cut that there. I'll use that one for the head because that'll be fine. Sticking over a little bit there, a little twist in the timber for whatever reason. We got a trestle there, did we? Just going to fold that off a little bit. And I know because I leveled that line there and it sat on them, so I'm not going to go down the road of leveling that because I know it will be certainly near enough for me to get a level window on it. Because of course when I fit the window, I'll level the window anyway.
So what I've done basically is just create a structural opening. So obviously it's too wide at the moment, but I've definitely got... My height is good. Now I know the customer did actually... Tell... I'll tell you where he wanted the window exactly. All right, David, let's see if we can pull that one across as well. See the timber there, look? See it stepped? Yeah. Yeah, so I put a screw in there. What I'm gonna do now, look, is just force that back to where it should go. I'm let go of that now on the seat. It's flush now, so I'll take it out. Right, so there's my window. Right, so what the customer did originally tell me, this was the timber he wanted it off here. But he actually wanted it this side. So what I will do is, even though I messed up originally what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put a timber there. Yeah, and then I'm gonna measure across and put another timber there. But what I'll do, is I don't wanna be cutting this one out. What did I say at window was on this one, David? It's a 1200. Yeah. Right, so I'm gonna make it 1210. Yeah, 1210. And that will account for any deviation in my timbers not being plumb. And I can still get my window in at that. So my upright needs to be there. And that is um, a thousand and fourteen. And I should be able to use one of these. So of course these will come out and they're smaller aren't they so i've put a double trimmer in now um but what i am going to be cautious of is nails and fixings in there you can see the nails that are fixed to the osb What I'll do now is flatten these nails off. And they will go OSB side. And what I'll do before I fix that, I'm just going to double check my measurement and make sure I've got 1210 which will give me plenty of room to get this window in 1210 I'll screw foot bottom then and then all that remains to do then is to plumb this leg up if we want it somewhere near I couldn't put that in as plumb as that again, David. Right, and then spike a couple in here. What I'm going to do to stop that kicking over because what will happen is when I put a screw in there, it'll want to pull that timber that way. And take that one out. I'll just show you how to put the screw in on the spike. You send it in like that, almost straight. When it goes in a bit, just bend it down. And there you go, that's your opening then. So I've got 1210 wide, slightly over a metre high. All that remains now is to um, cut that OSB out with the multi-tool, and then what I'll do, I'll go fix the OSB to the other side of that, because it's already fixed to that one. And that's your structural opening created for your window.
I suppose this is the back and that's the back as well, really. Um, we're going to put metal cladding on. So it's a no maintenance. It's plastic oak metal cladding. It's a roofing sheet. We're going to show, hopefully, that getting made as well when we go pick it up. Um, we used to fix it with slate battens and then use, like, a little metal tech screw and then put a colour-coded colour cap on there. And then um, we used to rivet the joints and we decided the rivets looked a lot neater and a lot better. So what we started doing is putting the metal resilient bar on. So it's um, a dry lining bar for soundproofing. So basically it fixes at the top and it just sticks off like that. But when we put our metal sheet to there, we can drill through the metal sheet and through that and rivet it to that. And then you've still got a little bit of airflow, which you don't actually need much with it being metal, but we're still going to um, still put a bit on. But that gives us enough then. So you've got your airflow coming down there and it'll go around there as well. Um, and there's obviously bent holes in there as well. So that's absolutely great. Um, so I'll drop you over to Brandon and he's going to explain what he's doing and why he's doing it the way he is. So basically, we've already just put the bottom resilient bar on. The way we did that is we determined the level on this side, which we've already completed, and we went 100 off the bottom of the base from the front corner, which Dave will show you, and then levelled it across. And then once we've got the level straight across, we cut some 550 spacers, which we then put on top of the first resilient bar, which is already levelled which then determines the next one will have the right spacing. So, the rivets are in the correct place. So. Right, so can you, can, you can see where I've got that held. This is slightly different to the resilient bar we normally have, so we're just putting it on. Touch. Sorry, yeah, go on, slide. We're just putting it on, just on, on the angle there, um, and they're just gonna clamp it on then. Um, so, how do you know where to fix, Brendan? So, previously, when we put the felt on, we'd marked all the centers of the joists and timbers. <laughs> So then we could just screw straight into them when it comes to this part. And what size fixing are you using? A uh, 60 mil screw. So that's now got a solid fix into the structure of the building. And, and why, why, why do they have to be level? Uh, so then when you put your rivets on and you look down, it just looks right, doesn't it? Yeah, but we're going to use a... How, how are we going to know where to drill for rivets? That's what I'm saying to you. Oh, the, you mean the lap? Yeah, so what we're going to do? Tell us what we're going to do. We're going to get a lat after and then mark all the points of the... The, the centre of the resilient the bars. The centre of the resilient bars. And then drill that onto as metal, which then will run through straight. Right, cool. Right, they, they come at three metres, this. The building's obviously bigger than three metres. Um, so what we'll do then is just get a little additional bit like that there. Screw through that one and that one, and screw through there, and that'll just extend the resilient bar for the full length of the building. Like I said, we did used to use um, uh, like a little metal tech screw with a colour coded cap on it. They, they were chunky, the caps never set on perfect and stuff like that, but the, the rivets are just a lot neater finish. And of course, we've got the rivet gun, um, which is like a brilliant circuit. Right, so what he's going to do now, David, I'll just squeeze it in a little bit. What he's going to do now, he's going to carry on with these. Um, how many rows do you put on, Brendan? Uh, four, it finishes nice at top. Four. So what are we spacing them? Uh, 550, these spacers. So they're spaced at 550 and four resilient bars is more than enough. Are you good there? Yeah. It's more than enough to carry the sheet of metal. But you can see there, you can see how it's sort of flat, David. Uh, maybe look there. See, see once it's fixed back, yeah. it's, it's then flat to the building. And even though there's a little wobble in it like that, when we rivet that metal, screw it, screw it, and then when we drill it and then rivet it to that. Sorry, Brandon, I might move one minute. There you go, you're good. Um, it will hold flat on, on the metal, but we'll show you the metal when it goes on as well. And we use a colour-coded rivet as well, a little anthracite grey one. You can get them all different colours. We get our metal cladding from Forgale in Liversidge. Um, and hopefully they're going to allow us to go there. Um, I, think, I think it might even be tomorrow to see it being made. Or formed anyway, because it does come in a big roll. Oh, there, you just follow me over but that's your resilient bar, so you've got your, your OSB, which makes your building structurally strong. Then you've got your big full membrane. Miss that one on it. Try, try it there. 
I know that one got a good fit, didn't it? Could be a knot in wood or up then. Um, and then you've got your middle membrane, and you can see how we've bot bottom start up with middle membrane to overlap. So any moisture that builds up on there will run down. it will run down and just run off the building. And of course, these are galvanised. These. Right, we'll leave them with that then. Right, insulating. So you want 100 mil in your floor and you want 100 mil in your ceiling, which we've not yet done. Um, 50 mil in the wall is more than sufficient. Um, Davey's going to show you how he cuts the 50 mil and how he gets it into place nice and tight. Davey. Right, so first of all, you need to measure your wall there, which I've got 340 for that one. And you need to scribe it onto your insulation so you find your 340 on your tape and lock it off there with your finger and just give it a strike down. You can see he's created a line now that he needs to cut. What are you cutting you it with, Evan? Line. Cutting it with this rusty saw. <laughs> I don't mind cutting the 50, but the 100, that's different. It's, it's, it's probably the worst job, isn't it, doing the insulation? Right, so you want it nice and tight, to back to OSB. If it don't go in straight away, you just get your hammer and block. Give it a little tap. You need to make sure there's yeah. no gap at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, just one minute, David. Just just to explain them again. Look, so it, it's gone in tight, yeah, but it's floating, isn't it? Yeah, explain yeah, it, David. It's floating off at the bottom now, so you can't have any air gaps. You need that to go down nice and tight. And then just give it one more tap to the back. But you can see what a nice tight fit he's got on that first bit of insulation. But we put rows of noggins in, so you need another 450 high piece of insulation which is going to be 338. The reason why he's measured it twice is because when we built these walls, so we fixed at the bottom, fixed at the top, and then we pinned them to the OSB, and, but let's say there's a little bit of a belly in it, so you might have a wider space there, so that's why he measured the bottom one, and then he measured the top one as well. So I'll cut my second piece now. OSB and get my block. You see that one's floating again. as well, look. Yeah. So that is now nice and tight, there's no gaps in between the insulation and the OSB. And then that's it for your insulation. You'd have your nog in there, which would go tight down to that, giving you a level line all across the wall. Right, lovely. So what we're going to talk about nogging shortly once we've got the rest of this wall insulated. So what we do, we insulate the full bottom perimeter of the building and then we'll go through it with the noggings. Your stud height should give you enough um, off cut for your noggin um, to go across. But like I say, we don't set ours out dead mill perfect. So what we will do, we'll literally, I'll just shout a measurement, somebody will cut it, throw it through, I'll nail it, cut it, throw it through, nail it. And we'll nail them all, but we will show you them going in as well. Um, obviously this window height is slightly higher than that insulation, but then rows and noggins will go like that. And that strength is still transferred through there. Yeah. Right, noggins. Um, noggins basically are the pieces of timber that go in between the studs to brace it all. Um, you use two different types of ways to do it. You can do them staggered like that, or you can do them in a straight line like that over there, which I'm going to do now. Um, there's not much in it, really. We've had a little Google of it, and basically what they're saying is that if you put them in a straight line, it's to carry your plasterboards. But what I don't get, and I'm sure somebody will tell me as well, because I'm not a dry liner or anything like that, why people plasterboard sideways rather than not vertical because in my mind, you're more likely to get a long horizontal crack in your plasterboard then. Um, but maybe somebody can correct me on that. Like I say, I'm not a plasterboard person. Um, so the quickest way we found of doing these is cut the 450 cavity bats. Let me just grab a cavity bat. So this is a cavity bat. A cavity bat is a piece of insulation that is designed to go in between breeze block and brickwork when you're building in the house. It's 450 wide, 1200 long. We use them. They are slightly more expensive than the full sheets, but we use them for um, 
ease of use really, a lot easier to cut and a lot easier to um, handle. So what we'll do, we'll cut them, them at 450 high, so there'll be a piece there and a piece there as David demonstrated before. And then that lets us put our noggings in all the way along. And I'm going to show you how easy it is then to get these noggings in if I can find my tape measure. Brandon, three, six, seven please. So the way we normally do it is somebody will be on the chop saw. Again, the stud, the offcut of the stud will give you your noggin length. Um, your offcut rather, not your length, you'll have to determine your length. So what he'll, he'll cut them, fire them through to me, um, and then I'm gonna just drive them home like that. And if you can see there, it's compressed the insulation down as well at the same time. Have I put nail gun, do we? There we go. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just make sure that's in. Nail that. Spike it there. Nail that there, because I know that my frame's in there. And then he'll cut my next one, and I'm going to show you the, these. 363. So even if you cut it a little bit loose, um, if you didn't have any insulation, you'd be trying to wall, try to get it um, in and that. But if you cut it loose, it'll just sit on top of that insulation. I will cut the one after this one. I'll cut it a little bit loose just to show you. Right, you can see there, look, it's in, it's compressed. I'm going to spike it through like that. You can use screws if you want. Right, I'll cut this one fractionally loose and I'll show you. Um, three, five, six, Brandon. So this one should be loose. Yeah, you see, you see it's loose like that. So if the insulation wasn't there, it would be just obviously dropping down. So it just makes life a little bit easier. so on and that's what we'll do we'll just work along there and then what we'll do we'll insulate that little bit and that will be the front of this room and um, the walls will be insulated what we're going to do then um john should be here by then and then we're going to do the lights it's not i'll do the lights while he's not here and i'll show you how we're going to insulate the roof for a hybrid roof right so this is your tutorial about the lights so I've already done mine, Liam has left a bay down to show you how we cut it out and in this building, three bays, three bays, he's left a bay there, a bay there which has got a cable in, which we'll show you in a minute but we'll just talk about the lights. In this build there's five lights, Liam actually did do these lights, not two, me. Two rows of five. Two, there's two rows of five, so if David just looks at this, let's say this is the building and this is the door here. My, my writing's really bad. So Liam basically measured the room, which was, I think, 3,775, somewhere. Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, let's just round it off to four metres. He then knew that he wanted five lights, so he divided three, uh, we said four metres, didn't we? He divided four metres between six to get the number. So basically, you'd measure off this wall here, and let's say you got a metre, you'd get one at one metre, then you get another one at two, another one at three, and another one at four. So on. But just come back here though, David. Sometimes, <laughs> when you do that, when you divide the number, if we just look up here, you'll start, as you come along, let's say you've got two metres, you'll come here, and you're I two metres. Let me pull is... this one down, John, it might, yeah. this one might be very close. Yeah, it is, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Right, maybe show them. So basically, you can see how this one's quite close. It's not too bad though, I know that I'll still get a light in there. Because if I measure from the bay there, I've got about 70 mil that side. The lights are 70 mil, so I'll only need 35. But if for any reason, you need to come back David. If for any reason this turns out to be right next to this joist here, you can either cheat and nudge it across a bit, or add another light into the equation, and then divide that by it, and it'll nudge It'll nudge them about so that you don't hit the joist because I'm sure a lot of people have done that and hit the joist and thought, what have I done wrong? So that's that part of it. So if you come back here now, David, we'll talk about the wiring. So on this on this job, we've got the roof joist. They're going this way. Uh, the light switch is here. I'll just put here. So I started my first light, which if David shows you, is there. There's also a cable 
This is the first light there running across the rest. This here is coming from the light switch, which is round here, which I will show you on the video when I wire it up, how to use it. So that will send power to this cable here. And all this is one cable after that. It's just one cable to the end. So if you come here now, David. So I'll just draw that again. We've got our power cable going to the first light, which is there one more time. I've gone down here. Look, David, can you see it? Down here like this, not cutting the cable at all, down here, down here, I mean I don't know if I've drawn enough lights, to this light here, which is this one, this is the end, obviously there's only one cable now, because it's the end of the uh, radial, um, let me think if I missed out, out. It's, it's a daisy chain radio. It's a, yeah, a radial's just a, just a daisy chain, like in a circle, everybody holding hands. But of course, you do have at the end of the circle. What kind of an analogy well, is that? Well, watch there. We grab you, grab Davy, and and we link. But of course, the last person is solo and doesn't grab anybody <laughs> unless you're going back to the board, which would be a loop. But there you go. So I mean, basically, it's very easy to do, and the same technique is used on the sockets, very similar. We come from the board, we start off and it's just a daisy chain till the last socket. And that's it, right, Liam's now, I think, gonna show <coughs> you. I'm just gonna explain the wiring up. Um, just stand behind me, David, so you're right over my head, right? So there's your consumer unit, yeah? Um, there's the light, 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 light. So basically, that's what John's done, yeah? And then he's got his light switch there, okay? That's his light switch. Right, so basically, he's got a cable going from there to there to there to there to the light switch, yeah? Right, the live is connected in the light switch. Oh, sorry, it's, it's that one there, isn't it, John? Yeah? The live is connected to the L1, yeah? Then he's got his cable coming from his consumer unit. The live is connected to the common, and the neutral is then connected to that neutral in a connector block or a Wago if you've got Wagos, right? So what happens, and obviously yes, connected as well. So what happens then is when you switch that switch, that makes that live and turns on all the lights. So basically what you try to say to you is one cable from all the lights to the light switch on, yeah? And then one from the consumer. I was going to show them this bit when I come you, to actually doing it. I, yeah, well, That's you, why I've left it out. We, we, I haven't we forgot will, about they'll, it. They'll be I'm asking just, now. I know, I know that's what Right, well, you there. are going to see it. What Liam's just showed you, I will show you me wiring it in the board, going to the socket and wiring it all up. It's just at this stage, I'm just showing you this part of the build. Have you got the lid? Yes. I've got the lid. Right, OK, so... Right, there's three different types of roof. There's a warm roof, there's a cold roof, and there's a hybrid roof. Just to gloss over it, can I borrow that pen, please, John? Okay, and Davy. Warm roof. Joyce. Yeah. OSB. 100mm insulation. OSB. Roof covering. That's your warm roof, yeah? Cold roof. Joyce. Joyce. Don't know why they're bigger Joyce on this roof. Insulation. 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 Plasterboard, vapor barrier, air gap, yeah? So that allows the roof to breathe, yeah? Or there's the roof we do, which is the hybrid roof. Um, there's your OSB. There's your roof joist. And there's your 100mm insulation pushed up tight to the bottom side of the OSB and your rubber membrane on top there. Right. I know you get loads and loads of crap about this and loads and loads of people saying it does work. Some people say it does work. The truth of the matter is, it does work. Um, it's low occupancy, these rooms. It's not a busy house with a bathroom, five or six people sleeping and living in it, kitchen, kettles boiling, cookers and all that. It's not that kind of environment, yeah? It's low occupancy. Um, we've been back to some, John, haven't we? Um, if you search through my other videos, you'll see back when we went and there's a lady builds cakes. Uh, she doesn't build cakes at all. She <laughs> makes cakes in a 3 by 3 room. We've extended it. She regularly makes cakes in there. Um, she has six people a time in there teaching them how to bake cakes. So you've got all them people in there. You've got cake making as well. We've took down the spotlights and the OSB is exactly the same as that OSB up there. John's also took down these in his room. How many years have you been up? Five. Five years is his garden room and it's exactly the same. And I've had architects, I've had building surveyors, I've had other builders message me and say it works. And then of course I had a lot of people call me a right prick and saying it didn't work at all. So it's entirely up to you whatever you want to do. I am telling you now in the garden room under permitted development at 2.5, this system works. Yeah? 
Ventilation is key, yeah, low occupancy as well. Yeah, you need trickle vents on your doors and windows and you need ventilation. And your hybrid roof works. Right, so you can see here we've pushed it up so, and a guy did a report, I had a report done, four or five pages and it says it, it works. And that's the end of that. Um, so the insulation is pushed up tight and you can see they put some nails in there as well to keep the insulation up. The insulation has to stay up to the top. What's up? Match. Just fit your midget. That's all right, little brother. <laughs> the insulation has to stay up. They've also cut out the little bays there for the lights as well. And I'm going to show you how we're going to cut one of them out. Or jo John's going to show you actually, because he's got a mic on. So that's the one I've took down. John, there you go, mate. Is this mic going to cut it from me? Right, right, John will show you now how to cut out this bay. I'm actually going to come right underneath it. Somebody, by the way, I read a question yesterday about me mentioning a squirrel about my rubber on my roof. I don't know if it was a squirrel. Um, I do know the neighbour had had a fire a few months before, didn't he, Liam? Yeah. And big ashes were going on the roof and I was really panicking. Uh, so it probably could have been that. So I don't think it was a squirrel. That was just a joke. Uh, but I decided to put grass on it anyway just to protect it in case that ever happened again. Going back to that point, um, I once built one and I had a burn bin next to it and it was snowing and I threw the used bottles of gas into it and they exploded and massive embers landed on the roof but by the time I got up there, kick them off, they'd cause no damage so I don't know fireworks and stuff like that, I know people are worried about it but they'll be fine as well. Right, good. Right, okay, so when Liam did this today, he measured, I don't know what he measured from here, let's see, 700, so he measured 700 from this point Turn around, Davy. 700 from the false wall there, and then he's pinged a string line. So if you take a look here, we've got a mark on each one of these joists. So if you come here now, David, you can see this cross here. That's in line with this. So I, I now know that this is the centre of my light. So if I measure from this noggin, or no, I'm going to measure the length of the king span first, and I'm going to cut the length, and it's saying it's uh, 1135. So I'll do that first, get the length right. Well, he's, he's probably going to cut it at 1100 because 1135 is tight. No, but I'm going to do it a little bit less. And we'll put it's some all the way at the yeah. back, yeah. <laughs> Somebody's already cut it. <laughs> Right, okay. So some young man has done the job for me. Jen's going for you, Jen's oh, going Jen's for, you. for me ages ago. So basically you measure the length first. And what I like to do is... Did you see him looking at the top? I know, I'm thinking, where's 1200? <laughs> He's here. Go on, sorry, right. sorry, John, sorry. So sorry. somebody's caught me out there, they've already cut it. I thought it were my shades, but uh, obviously not. So Jenny's obviously already cut the length. And I like to have this as I'm going to place it into the bay so you can't cut the hole in the wrong side. So I'm now going to measure from the noggin now, Davey. You don't have to really see. It's about 268 mil to the centre. Now, Liam doesn't do his like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get 268 mil there and I'm going to scratch a line all the way down so I know that I've got a mark there. I'm now going to measure from here to the centre of the light and it's about 75 mil. So I'll come... Again, knowing that, that it's going to go straight in like that. I'll now come here, sit here, 75 mil, you heard it, baby. Now, you see that cross there, I know that that's the centre of my light. So now I'm going to do 100 mil this way, 100 mil this way, 100 mil that way. You should have 100 mil that way, but unfortunately, because the light's only 70 mil from the, the timber, I'm only going to have that much. So, let's go that way, Davey, mate, please. Now just, this 100 mil is not rocket science. Just, just, just while he's marking that oh, out, on, don't yeah, forget, man. if you go in the description, we are nominated nominated for the most charitable business of the year, local garden rooms. If you could vote for us, i seen the thing on the YEP last night, uh, Yorkshire Evening Post, and there's a guy in Bramhope, a news agent, and he somehow managed to get on that, so he's obviously getting votes, so we need to get more votes. We can. Yeah. We don't want to get paid for this. It'll be in, in, the, in the description. Have we still got that nice tool that you made? I have, John, yeah. Right, so in a minute, Liam's going to show you. So if David looks now, you can see I've roughly done... These lines aren't square. They're just roughly so I know where 100 mil is. I'll try hold my saw and get it square when I cut it. Before yes, you cut it out, 
Yeah. Shall I just cut your, your cable track? Yeah, man. Right. Do it. We so that, the, so that, so that the cable goes tight up to the ceiling, you've got the cable. So that the insulation goes tight up to the ceiling, you obviously need a cut out for the cable. Now I purchased this, the insulation persuasion omatic is a patent on it. <laughs> yeah. The sort of first in the country I've been sent it to test it. Now the downside to this is they've sent me a left-handed version. A right-handed rather, and everybody here apart from me is left-handed, so they can't offer it. Sure, well, there you go. Eyes, David. Look so how that's eyes. Eyes. the insulation persuasion omatic. Ronnie, if you're watching this, you need to get on this and make one of them out of aluminium, please. There you go. Cheers, pal. No Couldn't have done a better job with hands, so. So basically now, I'm just going to chop that. Even though my line's cockeyed, I'm just going to start and roughly use this red line as a guide for me to chop. And there's one. 100 mils not really critical all the way around. We just do it so there's a bit of space for the light. The lights that we use are LED, so yeah. they don't really get warm. What what each other, Liam? Again? Um, Shall we talk about lumens very quickly? Um, so we'll talk we'll talk fully about the lights when we come to fix them. But um, just two, please. Yeah. Um, so lumens, lumens basically are the, the amount the light gives off, and the science behind it is you need um, X amount of lumens to work successfully in a darkened room. Right, um, but in my opinion, and in John's opinion, and in everybody's opinion here who actually works and builds these, right, you'll basically look at the ceiling, I'll look at this room, and I'll go, I need six lights, I need four lights, I need eight lights, and if we have to have more than that because they've joist spacings, then that will be the way it works, John. Yes. Right, I'm going to keep this the way it comes out, because in a minute, I'm going to chop, or Davies, or Liam, he's going to chop 50 mil off the top that we're going to put in there, but it's critical that you keep it the right way, because like me, if you don't cut your angle perfectly straight, you have to put it in the way it came out of the hole, so I want the 50 mil I shall do that for you now. Oh boy! Right. Well, you thank go. you very much, sir. The good news about this one, it's dead easy to tell, because it's got a cut out off Liam's patent tool. So we've now fixed it. Somebody this. stole it. Where the f where's it gone? <laughs> Nearly swore then. <laughs> where's it gone? My oh. device. Brad sold it. Yeah, He's raffled it off. Nice tight fit. We love a tight Ooh. fit. Right, if you just look there now. Yeah, go on, so you can see up now. there. You can just look at the cable there. That this device, the insulation persuasion automatic, has created there. <laughs> Lovely little tight gap there. <laughs> and you can see the cross is in the middle. I, I, it's, obviously, I've not got 100 mil that side because I can't get 100 mil because of the joist. I'm still going to have to put a sliver of kingspan in which Liam has cut for me in a minute into this side. So what we need to do, I mean, it's really tight fit, but still, you don't want this kingspan dropping when you've finished your ceiling because it'll cause an air gap at the top. So we're going to put some nails in. They want to go quite far in as well. You don't just want to put them in a little bit because they can bend and fall out. Any more nails, Yes, Chief? of course, sir. Cheers, Paul. Jen, will you just do, will you just pop that in? David, John, just explain what Jen's doing there. Come on. Where is she? There she is. All right, so Jen is now filling this hole at the end because as Liam said, you want as little draft coming in to the roof as possible. So if she seals that, we know that when we put the plastic on that no air is going to come in here. And when I put this top in here, which I will show you in a minute, and the side, that will then make that air tight as well. With the kingspan pushed up to the ceiling, no air can go above it, so we shouldn't get any condensation. I don't know if I've got some nails laying. You can see Jen has successfully filled that hole. Little tip, while I put this up, I'm going to give it a little do that so it all doesn't end up in my eye. It's important that when you put this up as well, like I said, that the foil, as Liam just pointed out, the foil has to go to the ceiling and this side has to be facing down. I'll show you it in two seconds. So again, this is why it was important, putting it in the right way because it'll nicely go in this hole now, nice and tight. I'm just giving a good firm push and you can see there, David that we're looking good, but we still got a cold spot here. So we now need to put a little sliver 
Can you see, David? I don't, you can't see that. Uh, we now need to put a little sliver in here so that we make this a sealed spot and no air can get in. Right, what's this? Like that, and then Jen is going to go in and she's going to form any gaps that are visible there, especially where the cable comes through the hole. Can you get in there, David, and see the cable? So you can see what we're creating now. We're creating like a little void there for the light to sit in. So that's that's one type of hole. Yeah, here is the next one. Do you want to nail this up as well, Jen? So that's the other one with the cable in. Push it right up. Yeah. And then we'll form the holes. And then of course you've just got one there with no cable in. So you've got three different types. You've got one with no cable, you've got one with cable, and you've got one with a light bay as well. And that is how you successfully insulate your hybrid roof. Um, we'll go around and form it now. And then John, do you took your cables up before we um Yes we do. Before we make the barrier? Yeah, I tend to put that. them in a coil round on top here. I'm not going to do it now because the foam's wet, but I put a little coil there so that when I drill my hole, which to be fair, I don't really punch through the plasterboard anyway, I don't hit the cable, there's a bit of gap between me, my saw and the cable. Which right. we'll show you when we do it. Yeah, of course we'll, yeah. So that's, that's your insulating. So we've got 50 mil in the walls, we've got 100 mil in the ceiling, and we've filled that with foam if there's any little gaps. Because you're going to get gaps, you're not going to cut it perfect. Um, we've put all the noggins in, I showed you to put the noggins in. And there, what I didn't show you was plasterboard carriers. So basically, your plasterboard is going to go like that. And if I hadn't put that piece of timber in there, there'd be a loose end on there. So you need to stick a bit of timber in there, get it screwed to that wall. Or where is another one? You can see over there, look, we've run some down as well. The reason why there's a gap in that one there is because the light switch will be going in there. We've got to put a back box in there, so I've already preempted that one. Um, so that's it, that's your insulation and that's your first fixed lighting. And then, so we didn't answer any questions yesterday, so we're going to do a few today. Oh, Stuart Moore, let's answer this one. Your noggins on one side are staggered as to fixing without toe nailing, whatever that means. Toe nailing. Oh, right. I did this with my walls and roof, but yours is in one straight line. Is this for structural stability or something that you do? No, so we talked about it earlier on, it's not for structural stability. The, the noggins are for structural stability, but whether you stagger them like that, staggering them is easier to fix because you can fix, 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 you know, fix, fix. You can face fix it, can't you? But if you put them in like that, you've got to spike it. So let's say that one goes in there and that one's already in, I've got to spike it through there, but then I can fix it through there, then I put that one in, spike it, fix it, and so on. Um, there's absolutely nothing in it, but we talked about this morning that, um, from what we Googled is, people tend to do it for plasterboard, and if they're going to plasterboard, um, a long ways rather than vertical, horizontally rather than vertically. <laughs> I'll get right. my words out in a minute. Right, Colin S, are you not... Are you not using upside down joist hangers on the roof? No, simply because this the door is the opposite around. Normally the door would be here and we would use the, the upside down hangers there, but because the door is on the side elevation, then we haven't had to use them on this one. Um, I'll just show you a little tip here, look. If you screw in, look. Um, these are plasterboard carriers, so when we plasterboard this ceiling, I want to tie it into this wall here, so we're putting a bit of OSB on the top, and I want the OSB to be level with the top of that board which is um, also level with the bottom of that roof joist. So you watch this, this will drive up now and push through it. You see like it did there? Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll back it off again. Do it again. And you see there, it pulls it down. Yeah, yeah. so, get it in a little bit, pull it back off, get it in a little bit, pull it back off. Yeah, pass my head. Wonky 2348. Have you considered crowdfunding to see if you can raise the money to start a new pod venture? If a majority of your subs contributed one pound, which is a ridiculously small amount of change for all the knowledge you have shared over the past few years with your videos, then it would make it worthwhile venture. Okay, so let me talk about crowdfunding, the pod business and 
what, what I'm going to do with that. All right, so crowdfunding, it's great, you know, it would be a great thing if everybody says, yeah, they'd, they'd give a pound. John, you can fire away if you want. It would be great if everybody said they would give a pound, but as you know, what people say and what people do are two different things. Um, I've got 80,000 subscribers. Is 80,000 now? And three. 80,300. Um, if every single one of you voted for us, we would, I, without a shadow of doubt, I'd imagine we'd win it. But the truth of the matter is, people don't actually, don't actually fulfil sometimes. So even if 50% of the subscribers, which would be 40,000, um, all chipped in a pound, then that would get it up and going, but it would be so difficult to get them to that. So the second part of crowdfunding is, um, somebody mentioned it, what about if you had 50 people that donated a thousand, a, well, not donated, but that gave a thousand pounds each, which would be the 50,000 pounds required, yeah? So let's say you donated a thousand pounds. I'm going to stop using the word donation because donation means you're getting free. Let's say you invested a thousand pounds and and let's say I gave you twelve hundred and fifty back um, after the second year at a very push, but possibly at first. It would be more than your thousand pounds would raise in the bank, I'd imagine. Crowdfunding tends to be, from what I've Googled, but somewhere between eight to fifteen percent return. So eight to fifteen percent return on a thousand pounds is obviously um, 80 to 150 pounds, isn't it? Um, but I'd say, like, I'll give you 250 pounds back on your thousand pounds. If that's what, if, if there's enough people, right? If there's 50 people out there that want to, that want to contribute um, to crowdfunding, and I'll set it up, thousand pound each, I'll give you a return back on it, and you'll have, um, you'll have the knowledge that, you know, you've helped us go on to a next step, plus you'll get some money back on yours. So that's it, 50, 50 people, thousand pound each, yeah? And Sternus Hammer, there's a six digit code, yeah? It's been shown a few times. I know full well that two people have definitely got it so far. Um, I'm going to buy a burner phone number and you can text message me the number. Do you want to do one more question before we crack on? Uh, what time is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, go on, you've got loads. Daniel Cookie, or Cook, do you need to strap down the roof onto the wall plates as per the flat roofs on extensions? So, um, you've seen what I've done, I've spiked it down, um, I've triple spiked it both sides and we've screwed it from the other side as well and we will strap it down with um, joist hangers but that's more than sufficient, um, that's it, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that, that's fine. So would you use screws instead of nails to attach the roof down? As I, was I use both, yeah. we use both, so sometimes like if somebody's on this side and I'm on the roof they'll stick a screw through there or stick a nail through there. But we tend to use both types of fixings, nails and screws. Right, okay. My Obviously point... nails, nails, nails bend, screws snap, but you know, when you've got two bits of wood together like that, whatever you've got holding it, you're not going to pull apart anyway. Right, so Michael Sloan, quite often people might have limited budget to self-build. With material prices going up, are there any obvious places you could identify as a potential cost saving? Perhaps a different floor or thinner or no, S no OSB on the walls? Right, so you could get away with 18 mil floor, um, but then you wouldn't want to be doing what we do and spanning the joists. You'd want your 18 mil to fall on your timbers, which would mean you'd want more timbers. It would save you money in the long run, um, but very little. OSB, you, I would say do not, do not, not OSB the walls. You have to OSB the walls. The structural stability of this room now, once we've got that OSB on, is, is really, really strong. Um, and then, of course, when we put the roof on, the roof becomes one and the walls are one. It's absolutely rigid. Um, things that you could save on doors and windows, maybe. Um, the fact of the matter is, right, if you're going to build a gallery room, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money. So you, if you're going to invest a lot of money into something, you're better off doing it right rather than trying to save. Um, cedar's ridiculously expensive. Maybe do a different kind of cladding. Right, so is there essential build steps that you suggest people do not change under any circumstances? Uh, the OSB, do, do not do away with OSB and you want the OSB. Um, I'd definitely put a steel or a flitch beam or a, at the minimum a double timber above a door bolted together. Could you, I know this probably sounds stupid, but could you viably put the 3 by 2 instead of 4 by 2 or is that You could do 3 by 2 instead of 4 by 2 yeah, and we, we, we did actually start off doing that and we just moved up to... Um, I'm building them commercially. If, if you're doing it at home, 3 by 2 John, what's yeah, your walls? John, John's a 3 by 2 uh, 6 by 4 John's is a 6x4, he's used 3x2 and he's got zero cracks in his build. So, yeah, if you're building it at home, 3x2 is enough. Um, commercially, we use 4x2. Right, Gary Seddon, have you ever tried spray foam insulation on the walls and roof? Now, I really would like to try that. 
Um, no, um, and I know it gets quite slagging off for roofs in houses, doesn't really? it? Um, and uh, it'll be just the cost. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It really does rot. It does rot. Apparently, apparently it rots. Apparently it rots, and it's a time bomb for all these people that have had the roofs insulated. Oh, here's a funny one. So you said that you once parked up in a multi-storey on a trip to London. You asked a guy to help you with the payment machine, mm -hmm. as you didn't get it. He put the money on his registration and walked off laughing. Is that true? <laughs> Yeah, it's true, yeah. Um, so I was really quite naive. It was a long, long time ago. But went to London, parked in a multi-storey, didn't know how to work the machine. You know, we had to put your registration in, John. So I said to this bloke, I went, I don't understand it, mate. So he went, hold on a minute. He went, put your money in, put your money in. He put his reg in, ticket came out, and he went, cheers, and walked off. And I was just stood there like... You want to kick it? John, I was like 19 or something. He's like this big cockney bloke. Just, yeah. bent, just bent me over and had me. Next oh, one. No. Um, Dave Pangolin, is Postcrete suitable for odds? Right, Postcrete is not sufficiently strong enough in my opinion, but John, I'm thinking what we might do, right? We might get two buckets, we might put one with Postcrete in it, one with the concrete mix in it, we'll let them go off, we'll let them cure for a couple yeah, of weeks, on. we'll pop them out and we'll see how quickly we can smash one to pieces with a sledgehammer. Should we do that? Maybe strong enough, might have we? Yeah, but, but commercially we won't. Yeah, so let, yeah. let's do that. What we're going to do, we're going to get two buckets and we're going to fill them up with concrete. Um, and what we'll do, we'll put a little capsule in them with a £20 note in it. Yeah? <laughs> right? Yeah, and whoever gets it first gets, gets to keep the, the £20 20. note. Yeah, nice. that's what we'll do. Right, well, Keen. And we'll, what we'll do, we'll set, we'll set, we'll set Davy and Jen on them yeah. uh, with a sledgehammer each. Yeah. That's sound good, Davy? David's eyes are just yeah. little. He's 20 pound <laughs> richer already. Right, uh, next one. Keen DNB, do you ever apply the wall after insulating before the plasterboard so you have good fixing points when the build is complete? Uh, I think we might have done it once before, not sure. Um, but have we done it once before? Yes. Yeah, so what, what I've also done before and all uh, when I was um, a younger joiner, um, and we did a lot of nightclub fits and that, and what they do, they always be the wall before they plaster it, stop people kicking their feet through it. Um, but yeah, it's an idea. But what we'll do, John's just been to ask customer now, there's no TV on here, but we would put papyrus. You see there, look, John's put a papyrus in the wall. Yeah, that is for the consumer unit. That'll obviously get covered. Yeah, um, but that's that's a papyrus in the wall. That's all you need, really, papyrus, where, wherever you need your stuff. Right, Tony Rhodes, do you ever use a flitch beam above a bifold opening? No, um, we have done previously, haven't we, John? Remember that lady that made us cakes in York all the time? Yeah, yeah, no, it would work, it would work. But like I say, everything we do is slightly over-engineered just because of the fact um, we're building them commercially. But a flitch beam would be good unless your top door, unless your door is top hung and then you've got your weight on there pulling out. And the thing is with the flitch beam, on its side it's good, but you put it like that, you can pull it and bend it because I've done that before. Right. Last question. Jason Longton, have you ever considered an annex build? He wants an 11 by 3.5 and would like us to do it. He would be happy for us to get involved and document the process. An annex build? Um, yeah, I, I would consider it. When my dad got poorly, what my intention was to do was to build an annex in my garden because planning says that as long as it's portable and I'm going to build it on a metal frame so officially you could crane it, then I was going to build that because I know there's plenty of companies that build them and they're in excess of £100,000 for an annex. Now, I know I could build an annex for 50 grand, let's say. <coughs> what? So it's, it's, it's a garden room almost, for, you know, but it's like you've got everything in it. So you've got like your bathroom, um, like, like a living lodge, room. when you go to a lodge, living room, kitchen, everything, you know. But a lot of people have them for like when their parents come and live with them, do you know, like, or they're disabled or they've got needs or whatever. So they'll come and live with them, build an annex in the garden. But there is a way around the planning for it. So that might be an option for lots of people. It depends where you are as well. Um, but yeah, I'd like to pull an annex for somebody. Right. So I think do you the, want the, to. Oh, do more. them all now while everybody's getting everything There's together and cleaned up. Keith Widows, what happened to the green seaweed superfood? <laughs> John, come here. Come here. Come here. Sea <laughs> <laughs> moss. That's sea moss. Right. You'll give your verdict on sea moss, John. Um, Why are you not taking it anymore? Let's go, let's go down that road. One, because it's expensive, really expensive. So my mate got me onto the better stuff, reckoning it'd make me feel like Superman. Um, I think it does do something, but I don't know if it were worth 30, 35 quid a jar. What do you think? Uh, I, 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 I think it does have benefits. You do, 
start to feel a little bit more looser, your joints are hurting, but is it psychological? Is it a placebo? I don't know. And it tastes like shit, doesn't it, John? It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> I've not tasted I'd imagine it's like eating wallpaper paste. It's got that consistency, hasn't it? It's it's like like I mean, it's got a lot of good stuff here, hasn't it? You oh, know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. John was bald before he started taking it. Didn't have hair in your head, did you? Oh, 79. Can, oh, can you believe, look, he's got a, a bit, he's no grey hair. How old are you? 48. 48 and no grey hair. Mm, right, are you ready? What model number is your Makita impact gun you are using? Where's yours, John? David, let's have mine out. Let's have. Uh, is it going back in van? Yeah. No, it's a D1711. I don't know what I don't know what mine is. Um, Ronnie, if you're watching this, you might want to get on this, mate. Yeah. Um, it's literally got the cut out and two blades. Um, I, I, I won't lie, I seen it on TikTok and I thought it was amazing, but somehow we managed to drill through the blade and I've never found a drill but that could drill through the blade. But if only if you're watching. <laughs> right, okay, let, let's talk about drills. Davey, will you also bring up the pack out, please, if you won't mind? And can I have my pack out in here as well, if you won't mind? Bring, bring up the Milwaukee one as well, please. Right, my drill, where's. where's Right. <laughs> my, my drill, um, did I import this, John? Yeah, I think you did. I think I might have imported it. It's a DTD, a DT, Delta Tango Delta 171. Oh, there was a guy I forgot. He was, he was in the military and he did a mock-up of me doing a video. And they went, Delta, Del, Delta Tango Delta 171. But that's what that is. Um, I think it was an import. It's got loads of speeds on it, but I only go full throttle. So I always have about on fast speed. Now, John. What? Same here, I'm not. Is yours as well? Yeah. Right, John. John's drill. Hold on, let me give you a mic. Hold on, I'll, I'll do the one. We all know that a couple of weeks ago I Where's took the mic? drill. Sorry, John. In temper. And just wait for Liam. I've got. You give me the ones that I've got on. Hang on, Jenny's got it. <laughs> Jenny, you just can't ask a question for a minute, but you can have this one. This should this. be able to win me anyway. No, well, yeah, speak up, and they will. Right. Okay. So, right. I That's took it in Collingham Sorry. River. Yeah. So I went out, and I, but I didn't actually buy another. I already had it. I am going to buy this when this next one breaks, but I already had this one brand new in shed. I got it cheap off somebody. <laughs> it's a Milwaukee. It's actually the self-same model. It is a M18 FID2 Gen 3 impact driver. It's fantastic, but when you squeeze the trigger to start fast, as Liam's talking about, it, it, well, yeah, it's probably just it, it just jumps off the screw. And it's so annoying because sometimes it jumps off and digs straight in your hand. If you start a little bit slower and then speed up, it's okay. But like I say, I will be getting Makita. Uh, not Makita everything. It'll only be a Makita impact driver. Now, we know Mr. Liam here slags Milwaukee. But wait, got, wait, 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 on, we'll go got, to that in a minute. We'll oh, go right, a minute. Go on, go. So, basically, it's got a, is it, call it a variable speed, John? Yeah. I, a variable speed. Amazing, so, right. look, you see, look, I've got my finger just on it, obviously. But that has got, got the same, same on it, same but spare. it just goes full throttle. No, when you pull the trigger, you can do it really slow, like that, look like that, okay? Yeah. All like that. Yeah. But it just, it wants to well, go it's straight Well, it's really, we're squeezing it too hard, I think. Well, it's not, because we've got... We've got the squeeze. We've got the squeeze. We've got the squeeze. Right, so, yeah, Makita is boss. Makita is best. John. <laughs> well, Liam always told me Makita's best, but if we just take a look here, I mean, he's going to show you it, but this is not mine. Mine's there and all over grass there. This is uh, Mr. Liam Griffins. So he's now got a Milwaukee pack out. He's got a Milwaukee rivet gun. He's got a Milwaukee nail gun. He's got a Milwaukee bandsaw. Um, he's got something else Milwaukee and all, I just can't think. Speed so, square. <laughs> for a man, oh, yeah, he's got a Milwaukee speed square. And he's got some Milwaukee batteries. He did have a Milwaukee chop saw as well, but yeah. it went faulty, so he sent it back and we got his money back. So I'll put you over to Liam. Quad as well. There is a Milwaukee quad, yeah. It's called a, a whiskey... A whiskey buggy or something. It's whiskey four, cart a whiskey cart. It's four grand. It's amazing. Um, the point is, sorry, you need to uh, tell them why Milwaukee's so bad, but you own fifty percent. Right. All right. All right. All right. So, so, so Mil Milwaukee is good, right? But but I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you this, right? Well, no. Right. So I bought this pack out maybe eighteen months ago. Maybe. Right. This handle here used to come up and down, but then it started pulling out, didn't it, Davey? Yeah. So what I've had to do is put some tech screws in it to screw it. And I don't know if you noticed, but you can't really push it forward anymore because the wheels have started to come off it as well. Can you see them splaying yeah. out? Yeah. And also, 
one of them clips doesn't work, so the top box doesn't go on. So 18 months later, and it ain't, it's no good anymore. It's ready for the bin. Now, John bought the more expensive one. How much was that one, John? About I think it was only 150 though. Yeah, you pay for what you get. Cheap, it was yeah. about 150 it but it was de-wanky, wasn't it? So we've <laughs> got the Milwaukee. I've obviously got the upgraded version, yeah? It was £210, but there isn't enough on it because... John's got one, two, three, four, five. He's got six compartments on this, and I won't have enough to put all my tools in it. Yeah, but now, mine too, yeah. How long did packouts come out ago? I, I don't know. They made one of the joiners showed me it, and I decided so, to so the, it. So, originally, the camp, we used to bring, like, you'd have your drill box, you'd have your gun box, you'd have your jigsaw box, you'd have your bloody planer box, and every different box, but now we just put all the tools in the packouts, and they're absolutely brilliant. I can't recommend them enough. And bizarrely enough, Brandon has got one without any wheels on. Now, why, why they Where would make a Brandon's? pack out without it, wheels? Yeah, Where come is here, it? Jen, Jen, Jen. Let's have yeah. a look at it, look. So this is Brandon's, is Brandon's pack out. So he, <laughs> he, he, he's proper, like, downgraded for boxes, I think. I don't know, but he, he needs to move on. So that's that. Um, don't forget we're nominated for the most charitable business, yeah? If you've watched this, right, and you've enjoyed it, the least you could possibly do is go on the link. It'll take you two seconds and just vote for us. Local Garden Rooms, most charitable business of the year. What's up, John? I'm just, when you finish, I'm just going oh. to show them why the locking system oh. on this is superior. All right, well, we'll explain that then as well. Sternos Hammer, there is a six digit number. It has appeared, and it's appeared this week as well. Um, it appeared several times last week. Will you know the six digit number? I'm going to go out and buy a SIM card tonight, um, and then I want you to message me with, not with your name though, just with a phone number and the six digit number, because, and then I'll just randomly pick a name, and then it's all fair there. John, over to you. I, I don't forget, I've got your phone for that. Right, so basically, Liam just spoke about... I mean, we're going to stop let's, now. Let's, let's, let's put this one on it, because this is the one this, that's brought... This John. is how the boxes stick together. If you watch, if you watch Jesus it... Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it is heavy. Uh, push, yeah. Right. So there, it's, it's locked in now, yeah? That's how they lock together. But this there, what they're supposed to do is... See that one stayed off? That one's gone, so now it's got like you've got to pull it, pull it off like that, and it's just it's just it's a bad design, I think. Anyway, and right, that's John. the only thing. Them two little levers with a bit of plastic on inside. That's the only thing holding the top on. So if you come and have a look at this, can you see all these compartments here? Every single one of these compartments. If you take a look under here, see every single one of these. One, two, all these. You've got to pull this lever, and all these click into there. If these get mucky, you have to clean them, and you'll see that. Did you hear the click on that? That's just superior. It just really is. I mean, I'm not trying to sell it, but it is, it is, it is just superior, isn't it? It is without a shadow of a doubt. It's not I mean, like a Milwaukee Impact Driver V's Dewalt. It's just phenomenal and it's I, I, I know we're joking, but M Milwaukee is, is without a, sh a, a shadow of a doubt better, better isn't it? It's, it's ergonomics on some things, they're better on Makita, but power... Yeah. You can't, you can't be Milwaukee for power, but you cannot get a better feel in your hand than no. Makita, can you? What about the Milwaukee multi-tool, though? Now, that's a geezer. <laughs> the, Walmart, the Milwaukee multi-tool is a bag of crap. Get it out. Just get it out. Get, come on. This guy's going to get some severe beating. Be Jenny, John, hang on. Whenever he needs a multi-tool, a good one, he goes, get Milwaukee. John, does he not? Just, John, just okay. humour me a minute. Yeah, humor no me. problem. You are. Just go on, like, fire, fire away. Um, is there a reason we don't use a hot blade a foam cut off a PIR? Um, so... Yeah, I've, I've said there's loads of different ways of cutting it. Um, it's a pain in the ass to cut. You could go down the festival route with um, an extraction and all that, and it's great if you've got a bed to put it on and everything's great. Away, um, but a hot no. Um, and, and there's a lot of intricate cuts and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I've never, I've never used one. To be honest with you, I know what one is, but I've never seen one used on PIR either. Right, John. Let's have a look. Right, Ooh. talk about it first. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? I know exactly what. You're right. Going to say. Okay. So don't you say it. Okay, you just carry well. on. Well, well, well. I mean, let's put the multi tools together. This, this is the Makita, yeah. It, this the is the brushless. Version. It's the latest one, yeah. The Starlock blades, which are, are crap, to be fair, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a bit of a scam with that. Um, but you can buy an aftermarket adapter, which lets you use them types of blades, which John's has got a universal one. Um, it's good. It's got six speeds on it, yeah. Don't know why you'd want a slower speed, but it's got six. It, you know, you can turn it off, you can turn it on. It's quite sexy. It feels nice in your hand, though, doesn't it, John? That's what I feel. Yeah, it, but this does, when it vibrates, 
feel, it vibrates better. It's like a smoother. <laughs> I'll take John, it home. John, John, John likes a nice vibration up his arm. No, but, but it's really it? smooth. Like this is a bit more. It's not. It's a bit more aggressive in your hand. But in all fairness. It, it, it walks out for power. It does. It does without a shadow of a doubt. It's more powerful. Even but let's say, blade. let's say you're cutting through something. Your blade's hot. You're in a customer's house. You've got a nice carpet down up floor. Yeah, or there's a nice little bit of line or something like that. You've finished with it. Your blade's hot. It's sharp. You put it down. Jobs are good on yeah. I finished with John. I put it down. What the? <laughs> Come on. Is right. that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Hang on. Can I just go back to this? So let's just go what Liam <laughs> said. We're in a customer's house. We're near some nice good furniture, whatever. I place mine down gently. Liam's goes here, my phone goes, and goes, oops, I've just knocked it over and scratched out furniture. So there is that. If it's already fallen, then you can't knock it over and scratch anything. But he is right. Who would, I mean, design, would, nice. who would design the angle on that? Get, get, it get it out. Get this Bosch is a price bag of poo. <laughs> so, so you've got you've got like a hierarchy in tools. Milwaukee's obviously king of tools, yeah. I'm not going to take it away from John. Right, now, You've got Duanke, nice, so. right, or you've got Makita. Now, I would say Makita is more aimed at professional use. And then there's DeWalt, but then there's Ryobi, John. There's Ryobi, there's Parkside. <laughs> <laughs> there's, let's, let's do this in order. Milwaukee, Makita, DeWalt, Ryobi, Bosch. Parkside. Silverline, Parkside from Aldi or somewhere, yeah, or yeah, Lidl. Yeah, some of yeah. them tools real deep. Silverline, there's another one, isn't there? Uh, uh, what's what's really low down on, on market range? Proper like, what 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 does what do B and Q do that? Black and Decker. Black, yeah, Black and Decker. Black and Decker is DeWalt, or it, or it used to be. What's what's that one? The Mag Magnus? Magasin. Magasin. Brad's got loads of Magasin. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Bosch, baby Bosch, right Bosch. down at the bottom. Yeah. Bosch. We got a screamer. Turn it on. Turn it on. And it's strong now as well. Let's compare. Nice. That's nice, isn't it? Ooh. Hold on, hold on. Uh, but hang on, mine's too weird. <laughs> So there you go. That's our that's our review of the multi tools. Oh, Milwaukee, sorry, Milwaukee, nice. Milwaukee is best, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So that's it. Don't forget. If you want the hammer, we need the six-digit code. If you want to vote for us, I would more than appreciate that. Full team would do because we're going to have a night out as well. And 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 if you're going to buy a build pack, there's 13 different sizes. Everything is included that you will need to buy. Full description list, full materials list, and everything. And you will be supporting us. And don't forget, if you've got a thousand pounds spare and there's 50 of you want to get together then we'll go down that road. Thank you, and don't forget to hit subscribe. See you tomorrow.